because there is general strong alignment within the state policymakers, environmental community, the utility community, that if we're going to get this much new resource on the system, it's going to require transmission expansion, smart transmission expansion, right? We got to be really smart about it. We're going to always look at non wires and other forms of redispatch before we just build, but you're going to need big grid. And I think by highlighting the magnitude of that challenge and really socializing that and trying to establish greater policy alignment through the governor's office, through the PUC, through the public advocate's office, we're hoping to take some of that friction out of the system and actually create transparency, opportunities for public engagement, but deeper, more cross-cutting recognition of the importance of infrastructure. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora in APAC and California. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Elliot Mainzer, President and CEO of Kaizo. Elliot's had a hugely impressive career in energy, spending time at Enron and then 18 years at the Bonneville Power Administration, where he rose to CEO and then CEO of Kaizo over the last two years. Elliot, welcome to Energy Unplugged. We're delighted you can join us. Thank you. It's really great to be with you. Appreciate it. I'm also joined today by John Fedderson, Aurora's founder and global CEO, who's going to chat with Elliot with me today. Welcome, John. Thanks for inviting me, Hugo. Terrific. Well, let's start on Californian energy markets, and there's a lot happening at the moment. Elliot, Californians certainly not unique in this regard, but whenever I go to a conference these days, there almost seems to be kind of two strands of conversation. One which is very aspirational, focused on policy and, and goals and long-term decarbonization. And then the other stream, which is focused on the reality on the ground. So challenges, for example, around CapEx and supply chain issues, interconnection queues, these kinds of topics. Now, California's making a set of pragmatic steps to bridge that divide to some degree. Um, the Diablo Canyon extension recently, midterm reliability procurement programs. But often it's left to the system operator to some degree to reconcile these these two streams. How do you keep track of the bottlenecks and and keep ambitious plans while also acknowledging the reality on on the ground? Yeah, it's it's such a great question. And I think for for your listeners who may not be super familiar with the California context, I think one thing that's important to note is you know, in California, our, our, our legislature really sets the broad ambitious energy goals for the state. So this notion of decarbonizing our grid by 2045 is really a product of the California legislature. And then our governors, including our current governor, Gavin Newsom, have continued to fortify broader policy objectives. We have a set of state agencies in the state who have fundamental planning and procurement responsibilities. So we have an energy commission, the California Energy Commission, that does the long dated load forecasting and the biggest sort of broadest scale resource planning. Then we have a California Public Utilities Commission who really gets down into the nitty gritty of doing the integrated resource planning and, and setting the procurement requirements for the utilities. The California ISO, the CAISO, we operate about 80 percent of the grid in California. So the big investor owned utilities, some of the names Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California, Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, those utilities are jurisdictional to the CPUC. And we operate the energy market and the transmission grid for that portion of the California system. And so, yes, it's, there's a lot of ambition, but it's a complex division of labor in roles and responsibilities. And so it really takes exquisite coordination between the state agencies and the CAISO to make sure that the resource adequacy framework and the planning procedures and the infrastructure development are done as efficiently as possible to meet these goals. And as you mentioned, Hugo, there is friction in the system. Not only has there just coordination, interconnection, queuing, which is very difficult on our side of the equation, uh, just making sure that you're lining up the procurement of resources that are matched up with available transmission capacity. And then, of course, you've had supply chain issues that have impacted you know, the international markets in terms of getting resources on board. So what we're really trying to do is, I think, every 
year, we walk into the, to the annual planning cycle and we're trying to get the very, very best information about which projects are lined up to come onto the system, making sure that the interconnection agreements and the substations are as ready as possible to onboard those resources and working through a set of databases and in coordination with the state regulatory agencies to do everything we can in the short term to take friction out of the system to onboard resources. And then stepping back, also really taking the long view. And I'll, I'll just point out a couple of things in the back to you. I mean, if you, you know what we've been trying to do at, at the Kaiso, we are the transmission planning entity for California. And so we realize that transmission being so long dated and being so complicated and so important in terms of getting resources, not only onto the system, but delivered to load, we've tried to step back and take a much longer planning horizon on transmission. So just earlier this year, we put out a 20 year outlook for the transmission grid that says, hey, California is looking at potentially as much as 120 gigawatts of resources over the next 20 years. And we've tried to map out the, the major architecture of the transmission system that's going to be necessary. And then now our shorter term transmission planning cycles are really geared about building out the network upgrades and the transmission infrastructure to meet that long term goal. So it takes tremendous focus, tremendous coordination to deal with all the different entities that are sort of at the table. Yeah, no, agree completely. Do, do you think there's a danger sometimes when with documents like the integrated resource plan, which for our overseas listeners is is kind of California's long-term uh, energy mix plan, or at least one version of it, and also long-term transmission planning, you know, a lot of sophisticated analysis and modeling goes into it. And it potentially sometimes I think in policymakers or just participants at large creates this sense of inevitability. Well, like we've modeled this, this is what the system's going to look like, but actually there's, you know, the future is uncertain. There's a credible amount of hard work and, and roadblocks and bottlenecks before we can deliver on this. So by releasing these sophisticated plans, it creates a sense of inevitability, which sometimes ignores the reality on the ground or the amount of uncertainty that's inherent in a 20 year energy system. Yeah, I think that I think that just by virtue of some of the very difficult experiences we've had in California just in the last couple of years, you, know, you go back to August of 2020, mm. uh, when when California actually incurred a couple of evenings of rotating outages. Uh, that was a very formative moment where folks recognized that that there can be a disconnect between the vision and the reality, and how much pragmatic action and coordination it takes to onboard resources. As you may well know, just back here in the early part of September, we experienced pretty much an unprecedented heat wave in California. Just, just, just it's almost even hard to describe how the, the length and, and the, the, the sort of mm. exceptional nature of that, that, that heat wave. And it took every last megawatt and megawatt of capability, not only in California, but across the West to get through that system. And so we are, I think we're fortunate that we have uh, Literally, we have a governor, we have a chair of the Public Utilities Commission, chair of the Energy Commission, okay, so we, we definitely see that there can be that mismatch mm. and, and that we really have to get pragmatic. And every day we're coming to work saying, how are we going to get that next tranche of resources onto the grid? How are we going to make sure that the resource adequacy paradigm is as pragmatic and as coordinated as possibly can be? And then to your point about uncertainty, that's the big variable now too, is how do you, you, know, you go back and you, and you know, we talk about this, this kind of cliche that the past is no longer a predictor of the future. It's very true. And so you have a heat wave where you set a thousand new temperature records for highs and your min, your min loads are all shifting. And you're asking yourself, you know, what will load and resource volatility look like over the next one, three, five, seven years? And how do you factor that into your load forecast and your resource performance? So there's a lot of work now with the Energy Commission, with the PUC, to say not only do we have sort of your base case procurement targets, the amount of resource you have to get on the system, but you've got this new uncertainty variable that you have to add into the mix, which means that your traditional loss of load expectation planning has a new variable. And you're going to have to translate that into a higher planning reserve margin to deal with that band of uncertainty now. And so I think we're, we're getting more and more focused on the pragmatics of that and also recognizing that you're going to have these extreme events that are outside of your planning horizon. So the state is also building a strategic reserve of resources that can be available for those super needle peaks when we experience mm -hmm. events that are outside the PRM. 
Yeah, it is. It's a common approach. It looks like that a lot of system operators are taking globally, which is look, the point estimate can be misleading. There are scenario. The future is unknowable. Let, let's engage with the public and engage with politicians, policymakers around a set of scenarios that are our guesses of how it evolves. Just one follow-up question I have on this, Elliot. California is a notoriously hard place to build things. You know, it's hard to build houses. It's hard to build. Uh, hard, hard to build industry. You know, Elon Musk's moved to moves to Texas for some of these reasons, uh, and so I don't envy you as the person who's building out the transmission grid. Does this sort of long term planning risk creating organised opposition to the build out of the grid? In the sense that you know, transmission is a public good. It's great in general for society, but it's bad for the people around it. And so, do you get? Do you risk getting socially suboptimal outcomes because you telegraph what's happening so far ahead? Yeah, no, thanks, John. You know, it's interesting that organized resistance that you described to transmission has been very formidable in California for a long time. As a matter of fact, I would say even to the last couple of years, almost by policy and by proclivity, the state had in some ways kind of an anti-transmission bent. I think maybe the reverse we're hoping is actually going to happen is because there is general I think some st strong alignment within the state, policymakers, environmental community, utility community, that if we're going to get this much new resource on the system, it's going to require transmission expansion, smart transmission expansion, right? we got to be really smart about it. We're going to always look at non-wires and other forms of redispatch before we just build, but you're going to need big grid. And I think by highlighting the magnitude of that challenge and really socializing that and trying to establish greater policy alignment through the governor's office, through the PUC, through the public advocate's office, we're hoping to take some of that friction out of the system and actually create transparency, opportunities for public engagement, but deeper, more cross-cutting recognition of the importance of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Let's maybe move on to market design, which is the kind of number one topic in Europe, particularly at the moment, as that market's under pretty profound stress. The story of deregulation in Kaiser is just generally very interesting. We don't have time to go into the detail. It's a long winding story, but it, to some degree, it got a certain way down the path, but then was hit by energy crises in the early 2000s. And to some degree, that put a bit of a pause on, on the complete push towards de de deregulation. So Kaizo, for our overseas listeners, is a little bit of a hybrid now in that it's got competitive nodal wholesale markets. It's got capacity payments and, and balancing ancillary markets. But it's one where still a lot of the customers are served by vertically integrated utilities, although new ways to serve the customer are emerging. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. As I said, real debates in Europe around when we get into deep decarbonisation, do you still want to be paying gas as the marginal unit and paying a huge amount of inframarginal rent to renewables? Those kind of structural questions. How long do you, how far do you think Kaizo's current market structure can take us in terms of its RA, resource adequacy payments, wholesale balancing ancillary markets, when you're thinking very long term to kind of 2045, you know, zero carbon power system? Yeah, I would say a couple of things. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think, first of all, you know, our energy market, I think, has many of the core conventional features of an LMP, security constrained economic dispatch kind of mechanism. Mm. And we have relatively sophisticated ancillary service mechanisms. Uh, and, 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 and we have congestion revenue rights. We have some of the traditional Federal Energy Regulatory Commission jurisdictional type structures. We do not have a centralized capacity market. There has been a strong aversion to a centralized capacity market in California. That is, and so the procurement and the capacity mechanisms are, are dominated by the state planning agencies and the utility procurement process. And we've learned to live with that. Um, and I think that, I think our energy market has generally been proving to be quite effective in onboarding a very diverse array of resources, right? We've got a ton of wind and a lot of solar on our system. We now have the largest concentration of lithium ion batteries, I think over 3,600 megawatts in California. We are still learning a little bit about price formation with respect to the battery fleet and multi-interval uh, dispatch and things like that. And just the heat wave a couple of weeks ago, 
had a couple of learnings there, but I think so far the market is working well. I think that you're, so I think something that you're clearly alluding to is as we move towards much, much greater penetration of zero marginal cost resources, and we have a lot more, you know, resources that are sort of, you know, clearing the market at zero price or negative prices. Obviously, traditional SCAD economics, you know, security constraint economics, dispatch economics start to change, and I think you're going to see more of the migration of the cost recovery of resources away from the marginal energy market into the capacity procurement mechanisms. And you're just gonna have more must offer and more capacity cost recovery. And it's likely for the foreseeable future to be done primarily through state procurement mechanisms, even as our market footprint continues to expand. And hopefully we'll get to that later in the mm. conversation. And we extend our market footprint into other states across the Western United States much of the procurement of new resource is going to be concentrated in state entities, even in, in California and outside of California. They're going to have to get their capacity pricing right. And that's going to be true not only for the zero marginal cost resources and the battery storage resources, which are just big arbitrage machines, but we're also going to have to have capacity cost recovery for the natural gas fleet that's going to have to still stick around for a period of time to provide super peaking capacity during the transition. So mm -hmm. great question. But I feel like we're, I feel like so far our evolutionary responses have been constructive and up to the task. And I think we have a general sense of where we're going to need to go in cooperation between our energy market and the state regulatory agencies. Yeah. I, I really, and I just to dip in there, Hugo, it's more of a statement than a question, but I like, I really like the answer. I think definitely you see a shift of value from the energy market to some form of capacity. But it's where I see markets breaking around the world, one is, not getting the locational pricing right. You know, Germany, where they've just dumped renewables in the north and the need is in the south and there is no way to guide it. Uh, so so you're just going to have very low, it's just, you're going to get have very low value power being generated. You'd say that for many European countries, the UK and generation in Scotland is the same. So Kaizo addresses that with the locational pricing. And then the other bit is those markets without some sort of capacity remuneration where, you have this missing market problem, really, where your your cost recovery for your peaking plant or your CCGT or your battery starts to go from 60% of hours in the year to 5% of hours in the year, or once every five years, you, you hit, the, hit the mother load, and that's impossible to invest against because capital markets aren't sufficiently complete. And so you need some sort of RA or capacity, but it's California has both of those. And so if they're the two things that I think get blow high renewables markets up over the next decade... I don't see either. I think just to speculate, I do see the challenge I see in California is just an aversion to fossil fuels. So trying to keep the lights on with four and then eight and then who knows, 12, 16, 20 hour batteries. At some point, customers will realize California is a very wealthy, but at some point, customers see that in their bill. Um and something's going to have to give and it may be politically embarrassing. And then there's a I actually you know, decarbonizing ionizing power is really easy until the last 5%. And actually that's like the hardest thing to decarbonize. So we're going to have to come up with a plan around that. That's where I see the, 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 the potential sort of issue in Kaizo. John, I think those are really insightful comments. I would say two things. First of all, um, to, to try to avoid some of the disconnects on the locational side, this is part of the reason why we're so focused on integrating power and transmission planning much more effectively mm. in the state, right? You just can't disconnect those two things, right? So you don't get the kind of stranded resource that you're describing. And then you're right. I mean, look, affordability is already a major issue in California. And look at anything we can be doing to bend the cost curves, whether it is just, you know, making sure we're procuring the most cost-effective clean resources or extending our energy market footprint so we can take advantage of regional diversification. Both of those things are geared towards lowering rates, but great points. Maybe to bring a couple of those strands together and, and talk a little bit about storage, um, I, I certainly tell everyone I, I talk to that if you want to build a, a battery, California is a good place to do it. It's got you know, the natural duck curve shape like Australia and its wholesale markets, it does have resource adequacy uh, payments as, as well. And it has kind of deep and, and liquid ancillary markets so that the price signals uh, are there. And Kaizo, I think, delivered something like 2.2 gigawatts last year and is looking at two to three gigawatts this year. So batteries are certainly getting built there at a rate that, that we haven't seen anywhere else globally. Um, Elliot, where do you see kind of innovation in storage investment cases? I mean, you, you touched on a little bit there. We're kind of seeing how batteries 
operate at times of stress and, and, and price formation. What's most interesting in the battery space in California at the moment, do you think? Yeah, you know, what's interesting, so the, our, our battery fleet is almost exclusively for our lithium ion right now. And for the particular physical operational challenge that we're dealing with right now, which is our net peak, you know, the neck of the deck of the duck curve, those couple hours after sunset when demand is still high, but the sun is setting, those four hour lithium ion batteries have been almost perfectly matched for that. And they've mm. just, we just saw them prove their, their value during the, the recent heat wave. And I think we're going to see a, a significant growth here just in the next couple of years or more four hour. And that's going to take us a little bit further away from the edge in terms of our net peak, provide a little bit more planning reserve and, and stability. I think at the same time, we also recognize that there are multiple inherent limitations to be having such a heightened dependence on the lithium curve. And so just chemical diversification is obviously important and duration diversification. We know that we're going to need much, much longer duration battery storage, not only just to carry us through deeper periods of the off peak, but also just to make a deeper dent in the gas dispatch, because California is going to be consistently ratcheting down allowable carbon emissions in the years to come, and you're going to need longer duration storage. So I'm very interested uh, in all of the new chemistries, you know, we're watching, you know, everything that's happening with form and, you know, the, the iron air technology, hydro store, some of these new compressed air storage technologies, I think are really interesting. The vanadium reflux, the flow batteries, all of those I think are going to be quite interesting. And then also just watching the, you know, seeing how the cost curves in general for storage, we're just going to need so much more of it. And as the prices come down, which I think is probably fairly inevitable, the ability to lay in larger quantities across different time durations for, 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 for sort of different, more extensive dispatch, I think is gonna be really helpful. And then I guess I just conclude by saying, we're also very interested in you know, liquids and hydrogen and some of the really truly longer almost seasonal shaping, because we're gonna to get to that point eventually where we're gonna, you know, you're gonna get into a Jan Feb where the capacity factor for solar fleet is gonna be so much lower than it is mm. in July, August. And you're going to have to deal with the, the energy consequences. Now. So energy storage is going to play a huge part in California's future. And we want to see as much diversification as possible and make sure that our energy market evolves along with it. Yeah. I mean, just to build on something you said there, the Inflation Reduction Act for overseas listeners had a, a range of tax credits for wind, solar and batteries. But I thought one of the most under-discussed elements of the IRA was the $3 per kilo subsidy for hydrogen that was that was flagged just i mean not necessarily to comment on that but generally your response or reflections on the ira and, and the transformational impact it's going to have on on u.s energy well the ira is obviously landmark monumental legislation in the united states yeah. we're all obviously deeply impressed and, and in many ways very grateful that that happened. And I think that the mobilization that it implicates and the onboarding of resource and then the, and the requirement of, for us to be proactive and prepared for those of us running grids in the United States, it just upped the ante again. So big time uh, ratchet up in, in infrastructure development in the United States. I, I would say that that the funding for hydrogen, you know, there's a lot of interest there. I, I'm, I have to really become... I'm, I'm not an expert on the hydrogen market. I'm obviously very interested in watching electrolyzer costs. I'm very interested in, in what we deal with in terms of transportation. But I do know that there are certain applications where things can work pretty well, pretty quickly. We have a project out in Utah. Uh, it's not a, it's one of our utilities, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. It's buying power for years and years from a coal-fired power plant out at Intermountain, Utah. They're going to retrofit that, that coal plant to be a dual burner gas hydrogen burner. And they actually have on-site storage there, big, big salt dome. And so there are places where you kind of have all the variables coming together at the same place where hydrogen application can work really well. And so I think you try to take advantage of those. I know that the turbine manufacturers are, are have the technology to, to burn hydrogen and gas in otherwise natural gas applications. So some ability to utilize uh, peakers and existing infrastructure. The question is going to be, I think, cost and transportation capability. And so I'm going to be like you guys watching that and seeing how that evolves in the years ahead. Just maybe a final question on California then. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a huge topic, but expansion across the West, you've been a driving force behind the movement for greater integrations of the day ahead markets ac across the Western US. Um, for our international listeners, can you kind of outline what's going on there, but also some of the challenges as you try and 
better integrate the resources across the West and potentially some of the benefits you've already seen, but, but yeah. model going forward? Yeah, you know, for our, for our international listeners, I'm sure some are aware, you know, the, the United States has sort of three major grids, right? We have sort of our, our, our East and Southeast, we have ERCOT, Texas, and then we have the Western Interconnection. And so the Western Interconnection, where we reside, covers a, a huge span of, of geographical territory. Uh, it's about 170 gigawatts of, of load uh, peak. And, and historically, it's been a very it's been a very complex part of the country. We have lots of different types of utilities. We have we have utilities that are that are covered under jurisdiction by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Many who aren't. We have big investor owned. We have big publics. And so it's been a very heterogeneous environment. And market development has been challenged in the in in the West United States. As a matter of fact, the California ISO is the only truly organized market in the Western United States. Actually, Alberta up in Canada has a market, but the the CAISO has historically been the only sort of FERC jurisdictional centrally administered ISO in the United States. Mm. Over the course of the last decade, particularly as there has been greater penetration of renewable energy, greater focus on cost, the greater sort of recognition of the value of wide area optimization and leveraging transmission connectivity and resource diversification, we have seen the development of a new mechanism. Back in 2014, the California ISO said, hey, Western United States, we're running uh, you know, a real-time energy market here in California. We could extend this out to you really quite easily if you're interested. And after a little bit of thought, one of the major utilities in the West, uh, Pacific Core, decided to take the CAISO up on that offer and they established a new market known as the Western Energy Imbalance Market. And over the course of the last seven or eight years, that market has grown to the point that it now covers about 80% of the load in the Western United States. It's produced over two and a half billion dollars worth of economic value just through a five minute market, just by you know, trading heat rates across that footprint. And it has now uh, led to a discussion about moving from just operating a real-time market into extending that into a day ahead market. Not a full regional transmission organization like you have say at, at PJM or MISO, but a day ahead known as the extended day ahead market. So we're now in the, in the process of working really hard on the extended day ahead market. And, and they're actually, we're actually competing with, a, with another entity in the West who's also developing uh, an energy, uh, their own versions of markets. But we're really trying to build on that foundation and the economics and physics of the EIM to extend to the day ahead. The big challenge for California is that the California ISO, we are governed by effectively appointees of the governor of California. Our governance structure is not palatable to the broader Western United States on United States on a long-term durable basis. And so as our market has evolved, the governance has also evolved. The energy imbalance market started out with one governance framework. Over time, we evolved it so that we actually have a separate governing body for the EIM that have joint shared authority on decision-making around the EIM rules. We're now talking about extending that joint authority decision-making model into the day ahead environment as well as the next ratchet in governance. And so we're hoping here in the months ahead to, to try to keep a, a nice substantial coalition of the major utilities in the Western United States working together into the day ahead market, optimizing that transmission variability and, and transmission connectivity and resource diversity and consolidating those gains. And if that continues to work, then there will be the opportunity to take an even further evolutionary step towards a fully integrated market with even greater governance reform towards a truly fully independent kind of governance structure. So it's really exciting. Um, I've got a ton of great people working on this. We have fabulous partners across the West. Actually, just back in September when we had the heat wave, it was kind of just truly, um, I don't know, I, all I can say is a deep appreciation for the level of partnership and coordination and collaboration it took across the Western United States mm. to make it through that heat wave. Not only do we have just exceptional coordination in Southern California, but we were working with utilities across the West, importing power from large amounts under certain circumstances. Other utilities also ran into issues during that heat wave. We were able to support them. We were moving power across our transmission system into Nevada to support their load needs. There was tremendous coordination. You could really see that not only has EIM been very successful, but the ability now to extend into that day ahead market and leverage that wide area of visibility and transparency and greater liquidity will make another big ratchet up in reliability and cost savings for ratepayers. So we're excited to take that next step and hopefully next few months, we're gonna make it happen. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like a total no-brainer, right? You, you've got a bigger, you've got a bigger set of resources. You should probably optimize them. Although, having said that, I don't. You know, U.S. politics is complicated. It, you know, based on you know, I spent a lot of time in Texas more more than most places, and I don't see them integrating or synchronizing with the rest of the grid anytime soon. Uh, and and they, they may be good, you know, good historical reasons, but it's not. Um, optimizing your power grid, I, sus- I suspect. Is that just to drill down a little bit on that? Then is, is that to say you think that governance structure and the dominance of Californian, you know, ca- the Californian legislature has been the biggest impediment to broader integration in 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 the WEC? Is that is that the big one? Or if you were to remove a hurdle, to have removed a hurdle ten years ago uh, that would have enabled faster integration, what would it have been? Is another way to ask that question. Back in 2016, uh, Pacificor, who was the first adopter for the energy imbalance market, decided that they wanted to take the next step at that point. They saw so much value out of EIM in the first couple of years. They said, hey, let's, let's, become, let's become fully integrated as a participating transmission owner into the California ISO. Let's effectively create a multi-state RTO. And that triggered a conversation around governance. And at the time, it was the, the, the proposal was ultimately actually never actually even went to a vote. It, it kind of died along the way because, quite frankly, there just wasn't enough stakeholder engagement or understanding or involvement. And I think there wasn't enough operating experience with the market to really see the true value proposition. If, if, if indeed at that point in time, uh, there had been a vote and there had been approval of, a, of an independent governance structure with California ISO. I think we'd probably be sitting here today in 2022 with a, with a, with a multi-state RTO. Yeah. I think it would happen, uh, but it didn't. And we've elected to take a more evolutionary approach, recognizing that you really need to be, bring people along and demonstrating the value proposition of each stage tends to work. So the EDAM is a really nice natural next stage, but I think that you know, that folks are now really recognizing that the value of regional collaboration, that they're getting more and more direct experience with it. September 6th just showed the West sticking together and what it looks like to truly cooperate across that wide area. And there's also a big focus on affordability. You know, this, we're taking on a big infrastructure challenge, huge resource transformation, and anything we can do to lower customer rates along the way to the decarbonized yeah. grid is going to be helpful. And so to the extent to which market integration is a tool for cost reduction and reliability enhancement, I think folks are increasingly open-minded to it. Yeah, interesting. And it's interesting to hear you talk about the summer and and California. I mean, this coming winter, Europe, sitting here in Oxford in the UK, Europe has its own challenge. I'm not, I, and you, and countries are going to have to help each other. Uh, and I'm not entirely confident that's how it's going to play out. I, I fear we may have some sort of energy autarky. If the French nukes go down, I'm not sure that they're going to be exporting much power. So I have my fingers crossed. Um, but it segues kind of nicely to a question I wanted to ask about where you draw lessons and inspiration from from around the world. And it, one thing that struck me in my conversations with with you know U.S. regulators, um, administrators, CEOs of organizations, I had Jimmy Glott Felty on the podcast, who's a PUCT commissioner, and um, he said something a, a little bit akin to what you said before. He sort of they're going down the resource ad- adequacy path in ERCOT at the moment, and it's like you know anything but a capacity market was kind of the message, and, and it was sort of you were very clear to you, you were very clear to make sure. You know, Hugo t- described RA as a capacity market, but of course, it's 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 not in a technical sense. Uh, and there's a sort of you know we don't want to do what those PGM guys did, or you talk to to states that have liberalised. They were like, okay, yeah, we we don't want to do what California did 20 years ago, and we did it in a different way. So it seems almost like there's anti lessons from from other markets in the US is the way people learn. But but are there markets or or approaches uh, you know around the world that you that you see and you, and you think okay I might incorporate that? You know it's a, it's a really great question. I'm I would say that the places I'm I, look we I think all of us right now are grappling with the details and the complexities of the transition. Right, it, it is it is a choppy transition, and transitions are always a little bit messy in that regard. Uh, but I'm drawing inspiration in the level of commitment and the level of professionalism and the focus that we're seeing uh, from some of the folks on the international side. I'm fortunate we're part of the Global Power Systems Transformation Consortium, and I've had the real pleasure of getting to know the leaders of National Grid, you know, Fenton Sly, Daniel Westerman in, in Australia, and both of them just phenomenal complexity and commitment and also tough choices, right? I know that mm. this winter 
for Europe this year is 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 forcing some very 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 difficult trade offs, and it's it's just flat out spooky. But the level of commitment and coordination, communication, getting ahead of is inspiring. Look, Australia, the, the level of of distributed resource penetration that they have down there is 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 amazing. And just watching them get ahead of that, while at the same time dealing with tough regulatory challenges and you know recent events there, um, but but taking it on, being transparent, owning it, and in a problem solving mode. I think that's where we all need to be. I think, you know, a lot of people say, Hey, look at all these issues that California is, is running into. I said, well, yeah, we're running into them, but we're running into them for the right reasons. We're running, first of all, we're trying to transform our electricity systems so that extreme heating events and droughts and all the crazy things that we're seeing are, are, are less disruptive and, and, and that we're dampening them over the time. And we're just trying to kind of be very frank and open with people about what's necessary to take on the transition and try to make good decisions. And then, as I said in the beginning of the conversation, it takes tremendous management focus and excellence and efficiency to coordinate all the parts to onboard the necessary resources to maintain reliability. So I think all of us, uh, particularly in those couple of areas, are, are, are dealing with similar challenges, but just trying to take them on uh, as transparently and as effectively as possible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, inter- interesting. I, I know D- Daniel and, and, and Fintan uh, fairly well. It's good. I mean, it's I, I'm struck by the evolution over the last 10 years of international cooperation. I don't know if Audrey Zielman, who was running the grid, I think she was behind a lot of that as a move, Absolutely. as a driving force. So good to import. Sometimes you've got to import them. You know, Daniel was at National Grid in the UK before going home to Melbourne and and, and Audrey yeah. spent some time there. So it's, but yeah, Aurora, you know, I turn up to a bunch of new markets. Hugo's turning up to Japan now. And I reckon five years ago, no one knew what anyone was doing and they were all solving the same problem, but with different yeah. words and different approaches. I think now it's, it, you know, even, even something like the integrated system plan or the future, what are the future energy scenarios? It's that you can see the mark and inspiration of other people in terms of how people go about stakeholder management, for example. Um, yeah. To go a bit deeper on that one then. Like, where do you, you're the CEO, you've, you, you, you know, you're making very big decisions on a regular basis, but where do you find energy market modeling helpful? How do you deploy it? Um, you, you know, we know your team, Guillermo, who, who, who runs it there, um, you know, hu- hugely talented group of people. Where do you deploy this and how do you make most use of it? Yeah, great question. You know, and I'm glad you had a chance to get to know Guillermo. He's a, he's a central part of the Kaiso brainstem, you know, wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, I think I think in lots of different areas, I would say if I had to call out two right now, we've, we've touched on both you know transmission planning and, and and analysis right now and really trying to figure how do you match up resource performance data in terms of capacity factors, seasonal shape, seasonal duration, with land use access and capability, with corridor access, cost, and while also thinking about non-wires, flow control devices, and other optimization. Mm-hmm. So our transmission analysis right now is really being called upon to try to come up with that optimal portfolio for California, because we talked about affordability. Transmission has been very expensive in California. We, we need to build infrastructure while keeping it affordable. That's one area. The other area that we're really, I think, ratcheting up much more, much more actively now, and, and again, in cooperation with the California Energy Commission and the California Public Utilities Commission, is really at the heart of resource adequacy analytics. You know, especially now, you know, the the resource portfolio in California has changed so much when you get a huge concentration of wind and solar and then batteries, which operate part of the time as generators and part of the time as loads, right? And the shape of your system doesn't just matter for an hour in the net peak or one hour in the gross peak, but it matters across the entire year. And you need energy adequacy seven by 24 modeling that on a much more granular sort of hourly time step is important to get a sense of sufficiency. But you then need to translate that into planning metrics like planning reserve margin or some other measure of energy adequacy that can then be translated into procurement requirements and become actionable and also interoperable with other resource adequacy frameworks outside of California. So analytics in both of those areas, I think are becoming much more sophisticated, not to mention all the work on our forecasting team 
just to try to get ahead of the weather volatility and the resource performance, sunshine, dust, fire, smoke, all of these things that are impacting mm. the performance of the solar fleet. And then also trying to get a handle of how is the behind the meter resource going to perform and how will it impact the bulk dispatch? So all of those areas, I think, are relying on much greater use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and just sophisticated uncertainty planning. Yeah. Yeah. God, I really like that answer. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, gone are the days where you would, you know, in the UK, at least you'd sort of pick the highest demand year and just add 10% to it. And that was kind of how much gigawatt and it was all measured in gigawatts. And that was all you needed. It was all dispatchable. And the, and the transmission grid was just infinity size for, um, for what you actually needed it for. It wasn't a scarce resource. So it's, you know, it, you know, warms, warms my heart as someone who takes modeling very seriously that, um, the very top of the organization is, is so, in, so engaged with the, with the work. I'd like to just, can I just, Hugo, if I may just dig into a couple of aspects of Elliot's career, I always like to do this in the, in the podcast. And the first one, it, it's a recurring topic, which is sort of Enron, Enron is a kind of hotbed of talent in the US. Uh, you obviously spent some time there. I think my most recent guest who was there was Kelly Metcalf, who's now at NCAP, who was there. She served in, in Iraq, I think. Uh, she, she, she served in Germany uh, during the first Gulf War, actually, and, and Iraq, and then worked at Enron. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know which was a tougher environment, frankly, uh, based on the way she described it. But what was it about Enron, you know, that made it such a nursery for leaders in the U.S. power sector? You know, it was so interesting. I I was uh, I was getting out of graduate school in 1998, right in the middle of energy restructuring, and Enron had had its early experience in gas deregulation. And then in the fall of, of 1997, they started buying renewable energy companies and talking about establishing their beachhead into California and applying the lessons of deregulation into renewable energy markets. And I, they just had me at, at that, right? It just sounded so interesting and so fascinating uh, because I was, you know, from an early stage, I was quite interested in, in kind of environmental uh, sustainability and, and energy markets, renewables, you name it. And so I went, I actually had a summer internship in 1997, and then I went back full time in 1998. And it was, at that time, it was just extraordinarily dynamic. And a person like myself, could, they'd pull you into a rotational program, you'd start out risk analytics, and you'd go into pricing and structuring. And the level of mobility and exposure was just staggering. And within the first two, two and a half years of my time there, I, I was able to start a whole new business function. I established the renewable power desk uh, for, for, for Enron and, and got that going. And then of course, poof, everything blew up, uh, for, you know, very wrong reasons for very bad reasons. And it was deeply, deeply disappointing. And I ended up leaving Enron. I lost my job. I think on Pearl Harbor day, 2001, I went fleeing to the public sector. I was like, <laughs> especially I grew up, I, I grew up in California. I'm from San Francisco. And boy, what went down in California with Enron was yeah. very ugly, right? And so I, yeah. I went running over to public sector. I wanted to get close to the infrastructure. I went to BPA, Bonneville Power Administration, runs a grid on the Columbia. And uh, so it was a very alluring and, and, and tempting company because of the promise and the people it attracted and the, the level of mobility and exposure. But at the end of the day, the business model and the accounting was so fundamentally flawed. It was just deeply disappointing. Mm. So yeah, bad chapter. Okay, but they but people stayed in the power sector, um, even if they you know even if they uh, decided they wanted to be as far as possible from that from that oh, type yeah. of practice and, and behavior. It seems well, there's a huge diaspora of people that that left, you know, got spit out of Enron, and I've stayed in touch with a number of them. They they've stayed good friends. I met some really good people there. It's unfortunate that. The way the company was managed, but yeah, and I think I think that there were some of the early lessons around around innovation and around new mm. product development and and customizing products to meet the needs of customers, and and really you know bringing creativity and optionality. There's a lot of focus on option theory and intrinsic and extrinsic value, a lot of focus just on understanding volatility and unpredictability. I think those are things that the company had a pretty decent hand on in some ways, and I think we've carried those forward. Uh, even into today. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, and just one final one. So you're a jazz music. I mean, you're a jazz lover and a jazz musician, as I understand it. Do you have any reflection? I mean, has the has the discipline of learning music and and playing jazz 
impacted your professional career? Do you see yourself applying that any in any ways? I think, I think, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've actually been playing, I'm, I'm definitely a, a big jazz fan and spent a lot of time playing my instruments, but I, I've been playing music since I was a little kid. I grew up in a very musical family. So I actually played, I played in chamber orchestras and musicals as a young guy starting in like the first grade. And I think, I think one thing that it does for you is just obviously listening and listening to others. And so, you know, I'm not sh- short on comments often, but I, I try hard to listen a lot and listen with good fidelity to people. And I think the other thing I'm a, on the jazz side, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a huge Miles Davis fan. I'm a big student of modal jazz. So I'm constantly, you know, working through, you know, Lydian scales and Mixolydian scales and Locrian scales, just getting them in all 12 keys and just having total fluency. But my, probably one of my favorite artists is Miles Davis. And the thing that's always beautiful about Miles is he's just such a master at sort of less is more, you know, he knew how to mm. cultivate space and silence and simplification. And I'm just a big believer in simplifying things, bringing, drilling them down to their essence uh, and trying to come up with the cleanest solutions possible. And I think that those are things where, where music has translated into a professional side pretty, pretty mm. well. Mm. I, I don't want to put you under the spot on the, on the pod, but afterwards I'll have to get your recommendations for some San Francisco jazz bars, but I don't want you to give them away to our listeners because they'll, 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 get, they'll get too crowded. Um, one final question, and I always ask this at the end of the pod, who do you read or listen to in the energy space that you think is always good, thought-provoking, and kind of relevant to your work as, as well? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I, 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 a few, you know, sort of people that come to mind, obviously, as a student of the history of energy, I've tried to wade through as much Daniel Jurgen as possible. You know, I think the history, you know, the prize is such an interesting, just kind of mm. going back and understanding where we're coming from. I'm a reasonably active podcast listener. Um, I would say, you know, I've, I listen to many of Energy Gang podcasts and, you know, Jigger and Stephen Lacey, I think always had great takes. Now with the new leadership, I was actually on that podcast a few weeks ago with Ed Crooks, it's from Melissa Lott, very interesting. I find one of my favorite writers, uh, now writes for Canary, is a fellow named Jeff St. John. Mm. Uh, very, very thoughtful on, on, especially on the distributed side of things, you know, we're a bulk grid operator, but I really think you need to see the DERs take off as well. And then just in general, um, you know, I'm a pretty habitual listener to Fareed Zakaria's podcast. I believe his work is really, I, I like to understand macroeconomics and what's happening on the global scene. Obviously with everything that's happening in Europe right now, uh, really trying to stay, stay tied out with that. And then I'm a fairly, uh, you know, consistent reader of The Economist magazine kind of across the board and then finally i was just thinking there's one a book that i read a number of years ago that's probably well over 10 years ago that really impacted my understanding of and particularly as we as we grapple with some of the climate issues i read this book called um, physics for future presidents by a fellow mm. named named richard <laughs> Mueller, and <laughs> never had the pretension that we were going to be a president of anything but <laughs> just the basic physics of of climate and nuclear arms and satellites and just some of the key things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis just boil things down to their essence which is something i'm always seeking for seeking to achieve that's a that's a great and, and very diverse list i think the issue you know i, I always reflect on is there's so much good content in the kind of energy slash policy slash climate space it's actually hard to keep abreast of it I subscribe to about 30 podcasts and get through about two a week. So there's always this accumulated guilt that I'm behind, you know, on 20 podcasts in any given week, but that's an excellent list. Um, Elliot, thank you enormously for your time. We've covered a huge amount there. I think in about 45 or 50 minutes, you're absolutely one of the busiest people in US energy and we're enormously appreciative of your time. Thank you very much. Well, Hugo and John, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I've enjoyed every minute of this and looking forward to becoming a regular listener. Uh, good stuff. Thank you so much and best wishes to you and all your listeners. And we'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. That was Hugo Batten, Aurora's Managing Director in APAC in California, talking to Elliot Mainzer, President and CEO of Kaiso, and John Federson, Founder and CEO of Aurora. 
Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.